Hello. On this edition of the program, a look at the 200th anniversary celebration of America's national anthem. We've got a look at the successful crime fighting efforts of MTA police. And there's a study being developed to address improvements or the possible replacement of a heavily used rail tunnel in our region. We'll tell you all about it. And we have your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment right here. I'm Paulette Ostrich. Welcome to Commuter Connections. Maryland is the birthplace of America's national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, which was written by Francis Scott Key during the Battle of Baltimore and the War of 1812. The writing of the anthem and this historic battle with the British took place near Fort McHenry 200 years ago next month. There are a number of observances and Star Spangled Spectacular celebrations planned in September to commemorate the anniversary, and Fort McHenry Chief Ranger Glenn Clark joins us with a look at what's being planned. Hello, Ranger. Good morning. The Star Spangled Banner is celebrating its 200th anniversary. What is the actual anniversary date? The Battle of Baltimore and the 24-hour siege actually started on September 13th. The writing of the anthem actually started on September 14th as that bombardment concluded. Now, speak to the significance of the day and, and what happened 200 years ago. 200 years ago, the British had, of course, already burned Baltimore in August of 1814 and were moving up into Baltimore, which was at that time the third largest city in North America, and their intention was to burn Baltimore as well. Fort McHenry was the only thing standing between the Inner Harbor and the British fleet, and their job was to make sure the fleet never got in and put their ship's guns on the city itself. So between the defenders, the Maryland militia in Baltimore, and the fort itself, it kept the British Navy away from Baltimore, prevented it from being burned like Washington suffered. Wow. Did the Star Spangled Banner become the national anthem soon after the Battle of Baltimore? Was it, was it sometime later after well, that? Well, although the banner itself was written starting as soon as the battle was over and continued to be written through the next couple of days and became popular within a month, it wasn't actually the national anthem until March 3rd in 1931 when President Hoover designated the national anthem. Wow. Well, now speak to the significance of a celebration at, at Fort McHenry, the birthplace of the national anthem. Well, this year is a huge year for us, of course, being the bicentennial. We have several uh, special events going on. One is the Living American Flag. Um, in 1914, at the centennial, 6,700 school kids came up and formed a Living Star Spangled Banner. We're going to make that a little bit bigger this year by making 8,000 school kids from the state of Maryland, representing all 26 countries from uh, counties from the state. All 8,000 kids will be there during that time. It's not a good day to be at the park, but it will be televised or on the internet across the country and interactive with different schools throughout the country. So definitely want to get on our website at that point and be able to see us actually form that flag. It will be a big event at that point. As well as the Navy ships coming in on September 10th, 38 different ships, about 14 warships. Well, along with um, several tall ships coming past the fort on the morning of the 10th. On the September 11th, we'll be celebrating or remembering 9-11 with the 9-11 flag being there and a large contingent of firefighters at Fort McHenry. That's in the morning on the 11th, um, about 11 a.m. On the 12th, which is Defenders Day here in Maryland, we'll actually have a couple of parades in town on uh, Hole Street, Federal Hill, and several things going on at the fort that day. But the bigger part of it is the reenactment of the militia in the town of Baltimore and the signal cannon saying that the British fleet's here. And then, of course, September 13th, that's um, U.S. Postal Service will be releasing the Fort McHenry stamp that morning. We'll have a ceremony in the park itself that morning. Um, the Blue Angels will be flying. And then the evening of the 13th will be a live televised concert in tandem with downtown Baltimore and concluding with the largest fireworks display in Baltimore's ever had. On the 14th, we kind of do it over again. The 14th, of course, being the day the Star Spangled Banner was written, we'll have a ceremony or some celebration in the morning called By Dawn's Early Light. And that's really going to remember what Francis Key saw that morning when the sun came up, when the flag goes up. Because the big flag wasn't flying through the battle. It actually was raised in the morning to show the British that we were not going to surrender. And that's going to be a really significant event that morning. And then, of course, in the afternoon, we go back and have another air show. And then on the 16th, all the ships will start sailing out of the Inner Harbor in the midday hours and come right past Fort McHenry. It's another good day to be down there. Wow, that is a lot. A lot it going on. It is a busy on. year. 
Are there any charges to attend any of these activities? The park itself is free. To go into the historic zone with the actual star fort is $7 a person. Uh, if you're under the age of 17, it's free. If you're older than the age of 62, you can get a Golden Age passport and get it for free. But the actual days of 13th and 14th, the whole park will be free. The superintendents asked for a waiver of the fee, and we've been granted no fees on the 13th and 14th. So you'll still get a chance to go into the Star Fort any one of those days, even when the air show's going on. That's terrific. So for those that may not know, where exactly is Fort McHenry? Fort McHenry is on the tip of Locust Point in southern Baltimore. The best way to get there anytime is really to use public transportation, whether you're coming by train, coming by um, bus, you want a bike, whatever it is. We're not going to have parking at Fort McHenry during this time. We're always limited parking, but we will have a lot of public transportation options, including a special bicentennial shuttle put on by the state of Maryland that will run to within half a mile of the park itself. And... Um, that's going to be the way to come into us. Well, we're almost out of time, but where can get folks get more information? Two places. Either you can go to our website, www.nps.gov slash F-O-M-C, Fort McHenry, or to starspangle200.com. Either one of those sites have a lot of information about the Bicentennial. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being here and telling us all about it. Sounds mm -hmm. great. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. Coming up next, the important and successful crime-fighting efforts of MTA police and how their initiatives are working to make your next ride on transit a safe one. Go. We're gonna we're gonna make some juice. It's gonna be good. She's excited. A little bit of kale. Please don't put this on. Line. I'm putting it all over the line. It's wet. It needs something. No, it'll go. Don't break my juicer. Looks good. You ready to try it? Come on, baby. Try. Challenge your kids to be active and eat healthy. It's okay. Okay. Like all right. They might surprise you. Uh, she took another sip. You saw it. Search we can for more ideas on how you and your kids can get healthy together. Chill raw and prepared foods promptly. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. It's no fairy tale that the right fit means everything, especially when it comes to car seats. Always choose one that's the right fit for your child's age and size. That does make a difference. <laughs> to find out more, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. We can make it better now. Come on, can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. We rope it up. Cause we know how to jump. We roll it out. Cause we know how to skate. We'll cut it down. We'll cut it down. We know what to eat. We'll swap it out. We eat healthy stuff. Can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. Can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. Yeah, well, come on. Today's a good day to grab your kids and hang out with them for an hour. Dance, walk, play a sport, or cook a healthy meal. Because just moving a little and eating better every day can help make you and your child healthier. Can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. We'll ball it up. Cause we know how to hoop. We'll mess around. Cause we know how to play. We'll drop it down. We'll drop it down. Cause we know how to dance. We'll veg it up. We'll veg it up. Night and day. Can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. All in together now. We can make it better now. Search We Can to find doable tips and activities that you can use every day to keep you and your kids healthy. The MTA police force has many assets. However, the most important asset we have are the men and women who dedicate themselves every day to ensure the safety of our patrons, employees, and those in the communities that we serve. MTA police crime fighting efforts have been successful in reducing crime on transit by an impressive 60%. This by no means is an easy task. MTA transit officers are out there every day helping to make your ride safer with a number of initiatives and resources. Lieutenant Colonel Fred Dameron of the MTA Police Force joins us with a look at the efforts of the MTA Police Force. Hello, Lieutenant Colonel. How are you? Good, how are you? Um, I mentioned the recent significant reduction in crime on uh, MTA transit. Why is that? I mean, what, what's made that possible? Well, a big part are the men and women who work at the MTA Police Force. 
uh, we always like to give them credit. You know, Colonel Gabriel, our chief of police, mm -hmm. always gives them the first credit for the work that they do. They're very dedicated to the uh, mission of the MTA police, which is to protect our transit community and patrons and to do so with dignity and respect. So we try to ensure that they have a safe and comfortable ride every time they use the system. Uh, a big part of what we've done to reduce crime is uh, by utilizing the ComStat process. Uh, we analyze our crime data and our trends, and we do this on a daily basis, and we adjust our deployment of our resources to address those issues as quickly and efficiently as possible. That way, it doesn't uh, become more than what it should be. How important are specifically tailored crime fighting initiatives? Oh, very important. Um, you know, one, one issue that we've had uh, lately for the last two years, um, if you've ridden the transit, you know it because you've heard the announcements, are the theft mm -hmm. of uh, electronic devices, you know, mainly the smartphones and the iPads and things of that nature. Uh, we've actually put together details called mobile electronic device details where we work with our local partners, uh, primarily Baltimore Police Department. Uh, mostly we work with them in areas where we know that there's a propensity for this crime to occur. Uh, we select those bus lines based on our crime data in areas that Baltimore City is also having an issue, uh, and we will work joint efforts together. And we've that's been very effective for us in driving down crimes on those uh, bus lines, uh, which is great for us and also good for Baltimore City. Uh, we also work what we call train sweeps, is where we go out and we will focus on the light rail, which is an honor system. Uh, Basically, in addition to our fare inspectors checking tickets, we will, based on our data that shows us where um, stations that have a propensity to have fare invaders, we will go out, use police officers, do 100% fare enforcement. Uh, everyone will get checked, and then we will cite everyone on the train who uh, does not have the correct fare. And this also has a uh, good effect on keeping the criminals off the system because they don't like for police to come on the trains and check them. Uh, and last, we use we have Operation Zeus, which is we've developed that uh, after 9/11. It's our Homeland Security drill, where we go in and we will saturate a station uh, with police officers, and we do so with uh, our anti-terrorism team, our Viper team. Uh, we have uh, worked it with the Federal Air Marshals as well as the Transportation Authority Police and the local agency of the area wherever we're doing this at. Uh, we'll go in. Uh, we call it target hardening a station, you know, because transit is still a prime target for terrorists. With school about to start, can you talk to us a little bit about um, MTA police initiatives that, that focus on schools? Yeah, one, of, one of our biggest initiatives that we've, we've been doing for years is the school stat. That's where we meet with our partners in the Baltimore Police Department and the Baltimore City School Police. Um, we meet on a monthly basis to analyze the deployment of resources by all three departments to address the transport of the city school students home. Uh, the MTA is the primary transport for all Baltimore City public school students. Mm -hmm. And as that, we want to make sure that all of our school students get home safely to their families, and therefore we coordinate our response to ensure that each agency actually puts an officer in the watch center for calls for service that are school related to make sure that all the calls get answered accordingly. Uh, we also have the Ride, Respect, Relax program, uh, which is the MTA uh, public relations and communication section put together where we go out and we give literature to the school official to distribute to the students. Basically, it speaks to the conduct of the students on the system, um, you know, how they should act and make sure that we get, um, they get home safely and that their conduct doesn't affect the right of others. Well, well thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dameron, for being here with us and telling us about all the great initiatives that uh, the police MTA Police Force have going on right now. And uh, congratulations on your huge uh, reduction in crime on the system. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Coming up next, a look at a study underway that's being developed to address improvements or the replacement of a heavily used rail tunnel in our region. That's just ahead. Looking for these? You drive buzzed. It could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. 
buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. They say that when you're facing extreme danger, your life flashes before you. <laughs> if you think that's sad, consider facing it before you even have enough life to flash before your eyes. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Deaths and injuries can be prevented by using the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to know what is appropriate for each age and size. So, I got this new family. And I don't know what it is about this one, but she can't seem to put down that toy all day long. Tap, 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 tap. Oh, and she even talks to it. She talks to that more than she talks to him. What's up, bro? Nice shirt. Who's she talking to? Her mom? She talks to her mom a lot. The Civil War era BMP tunnel, situated beneath the streets of Baltimore and which carries a good deal of Northeast Corridor rail traffic between Washington, Baltimore, and New York, is now outdated and in need of significant repair or possible replacement. There's a study being considered to address the issues of this aging tunnel, and MDOT's BMP tunnel project coordinator Jacqueline Thorne joins us with more. Hello, Jacqueline. How are you? I'm well on yourself. Good. What is the BMP tunnel and where exactly is it located? Um, the BMP tunnel is located, um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a research um, project um, for design and environmental um, study. Um, it's approximately a mile long, located between um, the West um, Baltimore Station and Pennsylvania Station. I mentioned that the tunnel is of the Civil War area, mm -hmm. uh, era. When exactly was it built? Um, 1873, completed in 1873. And how important is the BMP tunnel to Northeast rail traffic? Um, it's it's um, highly important. Um, the Northeast Corridor, um, it's a vital um, commuting line for passengers, um, um, for um, the MARC, um, Amtrak, and of course, um, uh, minimal freight on off-peak. Um, it's, it's a highly um, visible corridor that needs to make sure that we can um, have more ridership and more opportunities for um, travel. And how many trains does the tunnel handle a day? Um, approximately 147. Um, um, majority of those, about 57, um, are MARC, and the remainder are Amtrak. Um, local as well as high-speed um, rail trains, and about two each way um, for Norfolk Southern in the evening. Wow, that's a lot more than I thought. Mm -hmm. Who owns or operates the tunnel? Um, the tunnel is owned by Amtrak. Um, it's also operated by Amtrak, and as well, um, Mark um, trains um, go back and forth as well. Now, how old is the tunnel, and how would you describe its its age and, and wear and tear over the, over the years? Oh, it's 141 years old. I don't think we, you know, have you know many examples of <laughs> um, something comparable. However, right. um, it's um, managed um, and inspected often. Um, it's deteriorating. However, it's it's still very safe. Tell us about the study. What, why is it necessary? Um, it's necessary. Um, currently, the trains. Um, well, it, there's there's three different tunnels. Um, there's the John Street, um, Wilson, as well as Gilmore. Um, it's about a mile long, but there's a, a bend um, in the tunnel, so you can't go travel more than 30 miles per hour. So it mm -hmm. limits um, the speed of, of the trains. Um, so we want to um, research it to see um, about rehabilitation um, plans as well as um, maybe a replacement tunnel. Um, there's environmental factors, so an, an environmental impact statement will be done as well as the en environmental, I'm sorry, the engineering um, study. Right. How long will the study take? Um, this current um, phase of uh, the study um, is planned to go through um, 2017. Is the project funded beyond this study phase? Not currently. And where did the funding for the study come from? Um, federal grant um, dollars. Um, we had um, great support um, from Senatorial um, Mikulski as well as um, Cardin's office and mm. um, as well as um, Cummings um, locally. 
Um, they had a great, really great push. Um, they see it's a vital um, part of the Northeast Corridor, so we're very um, appreciative that we have that kind of support. Great. Mm -hmm. How is the grant initiated? Um, the grant was initiated um, through our funds. Um, um, 2009, um, there was an act um, imposed um, for recovery as well as rehabilitation. An FRA um, is the grantor um, awarded a, a, a Maryland Department of Transportation um, with a $60 million um, grant um, for this program. Now, where are we in the process now? Uh, we we had just initiated um, all of the, the players, um, all of the consultants um, in April, and in June we had our first um, public meeting. Um, and we plan to have another um, this coming fall. When will repairs of the tunnel actually take place, if there is to be any? This is a study for design, um, environmental impact statement. Um, so therefore, this is pre-construction. So again, there, there are no, currently no dollars allocated um, to move forward, um, but we um, anticipate that it would happen um, hopefully not too far after the, the program is um, completed in 2017. Wow, well, that was fascinating information. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it was a pleasure. We frequently mention the exciting places our Baltimore Mark weekend riders can take in and enjoy on a family trip to our nation's capital. But for Washington area commuters, Baltimore offers a lot as well. In fact, one of the exciting places you might consider visiting in Baltimore is the B&O Museum, which chronicles the history of American railroading. Just 40 miles up the road from our nation's capital and accessible by Mark Train weekend service, is a place the whole family will enjoy. A visit to America's birthplace of railroading, the B&O Railroad Museum in Baltimore. The museum, which is located among the city's historic Southwest neighborhoods, is a treasure chest of trains and railroad artifacts. In fact, the B&O is said to house the most comprehensive American railroad collection in the world. Well, the B&O Railroad actually was, had a keen awareness of its own history and began exhibiting historic locomotives at the 1876 Centennial Celebration. Oh. And so they, over the years, they developed this magnificent collection of uh, locomotives, the most comprehensive, the oldest, and the most important collection in the world. And in 1953, that's more than 50 years ago, they uh, opened this great museum here under the auspices wow. of the Public Relations Department of the B&O Railroad. It was here within the museum's 40 acres where the first commercial long distance railroad track and the first railroad passenger station were built in 1829 to launch the start of America's B&O Railroad. A tour of the museum introduces you to historic electrical, diesel, and steam locomotives like Tom Thumb, early freight trains and passenger train cars, railroad clocks, pocket watches, railroad lanterns, and early communications devices the exhibits and displays chronicle the best of historic railroading and its history. You can enjoy a day trip back into time, into the train world of the past, which bridges us to and provides us the transportation systems of today and the future. From Washington's Union Station, take the Mark Penn Line to Baltimore's Penn Station and MTA Bus Number 36 for a short walk to the B&O Railroad Museum and a day of family fun in Baltimore. Coming up next, customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment. Stay with us. kitchen surfaces, utensils, and hands with soapy water. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Quiet, please. Wait a sec. I'll take one. Oh, yeah. All right. All good. Take care. Way to go. Nice. Bring it on. Gotcha. I'm here for you. Oh, no. Please, please, please. I'm waiting. Interesting. Not buying it. Not fair. That's it. This conversation is over. Oh, brother. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. I'm having a stroke. 
I'm having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time. Time to call 911 immediately. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that could make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Learn the body language, the sudden signs, and spot a stroke fast. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. Welcome back. MTA Manager of Systems Engineering, Tammy Bolden, joins us to answer a few MTA customer questions and concerns. Hi, Tammy. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Good. What do you have for us today? Well, we have a couple of questions about student fares and extending service on a, on a particular bus route. First question, please. My question is simple, and that is why they don't extend the number 56 bus line out past the Glendon Loop uh, for the several residents that live out there that are in need of the MTA services. After the Glendon Loop, there's no real justification to extend the service further into the Northwest Baltimore County area. Next question. I have a nine-year-old great-granddaughter, and I was wondering if it was possible that a fair rate could be made for a certain ages from 9 to 12 or something like that, that it wouldn't be so costly for a, a nine-year-old to pay a 350 fair for all day pass. The MTA actually does provide a student fare of $1.10 to students traveling to and from school. Unfortunately, there are currently no provisions within the MTA fare policy to provide additional discounts at this time. Next question. I would like to know if they make an app that I could use, so if there's any delays or anything like that, that it would give me a, send me a text message or uh, contact me in a way that I would know and be prepared for any kind of delays. The MTA does not have an app. However, we do offer the mobile view of our main webpage along with my tracker. Now, if you wish to search the internet for other public transit applications, they, are, they do exist. However, they are not endorsed by the MTA. Next question. I just want to know why MTA do not give us enough time, allow us enough time to get on the metro, light rail, and the buses before they close the door. The MTA really doesn't have a set dwell time. However, the dwell time is based upon set occupancy and time to board. Thank you for joining us for the Ask the MTA segment. If you have any further questions, we would love to hear from you. So please visit us on mta.maryland.gov or reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tammy. Those were great questions and answers. Thank you. It's good seeing you. Well, that brings us to the end of another Commuter Connections program. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care.